webinar today. Yeah, to, us, to listen to our incredible experts panelists in the Restoring Democracy in Thailand election analysis webinar. Firstly, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we are all dealing in from today. For me, that is voluntary people of the Korean nations and recognize their continuing connection to land, water, and community. I pay respect to elders past and present and to all First Nations people whose land we will discuss today in this webinar. I would like to invite you all to submit questions throughout the webinar in the Q&A box, and they will be answered at the end of the, of the sections. Please note that we will, not, uh, we will most likely not have enough time to answer all the questions, but I will reach out individuals afterward to respond. And today, our moderator is Thomas Parks. Based in Thailand since 2008, Mr. Park has worked in Asia for more than two decades on geopolitics, economic development, conflict and fragilities, and regional corporations. He originally joined the Asia Foundation in 2001 and has served in various headquarters and field-based roles. He currently manages foundations program in Thailand, as well as overseeing programs with ASEAN and Mekong sub-regions corporations. He is the author of the forthcoming book, Southeast Asia Multipolar Future, Averting a New Cold War, with Asia Link. Look forward to launching it in Melbourne in this September. So I will hand it over to you, Tom. Thank you very much, Jenny, and thanks to Asia Link for organizing this webinar. So May 14th was a historic day in Thailand. Uh, of course, that was the election for the National Assembly, the first since 2019. And the Move Forward Party, as most of you will know, ex surpassed all expectations, claiming a remarkable victory with 151 seats. That's roughly 30% of the lower house. Um, Pui Thai, which was expected to win, came in second with 141 seats, or roughly 28% of the lower house. Um, the two parties, quickly uh, began talks to form a would-be coalition and within a week or so drew together six other parties forming uh, a coalition of around 313 seats in the lower house. Um, but as we stand today, the path towards forming a government seems more fraught and uncertain with each passing day. Um, the Thai system uh, has a combination of very high bars for a new government to form and a various legal tripwires that have created uncertainty for this path forward. So what happens next? Uh, is this a turning point for Thai democracy? Um, and how can we uh, predict what will happen in the formation of a government? Joining me today to discuss this are three experts on Thai politics and on Australia-Thai uh, relations. First of all, we have Paul Revillard, who is a former Australian ambassador to Thailand uh, from 2014 to 2018. Uh, we have uh, Professor, Associate Professor Siripan Nongsuan Sawadi, who is a lecturer at the Department of Government at Chulalongkorn University. And finally, Dr. Ain Simpeng, uh, who is a lecturer in comparative politics at the University of Sydney. So let's go ahead and jump in. Um, so the first question is, why was this election so important for Thailand? Dr. Simpeng, can I ask you to answer that? Yes, the three key reasons. One, it's the first election after nearly three years of youth-led protests in Thailand. It's the first election after COVID, and it's the election uh, that Thai voters would decide whether they would end an eight-year rule by the incumbent Prayut Chan Osha, who came to power after a 2014 military coup. Thanks, and if Move Forward and Pu Thai are able to form a government, this could potentially change Thailand's status in the region in various ways and might also affect Australia-Thai relations. Paul, can I ask you to reflect on that? Um, thanks, Tom. Good to see you again. I, um, I think clearly countries in the region, the members of ASEAN and others, will see this as a significant election in Thailand's history. As has just been said, it, it does mark a significant step forward from the governments that we've seen since 2014. Um, there was a sense clearly within the region that the coup in 2014 not only had a negative impact on Thailand's image, but also uh, had a negative impact more broadly within the region. Um, democracy was seen to be under challenge in a number of uh, countries of the region and, and Thailand's uh, coup was seen as being a, a negative element in that. So I think 
there will be a welcoming of this result. Um, of course, we have to see how it plays out in terms of, as you in, said in your introduction, in terms of the formation of a new government and what that will be. But I think overall, um, most countries in the region will see this as a welcoming return of Thailand uh, to a democratic tradition. And I think that will be a view very much shared in Australia. Um, after the 2014 coup, Australia introduced a range of sanctions, but we also made a very determined uh, decision to pursue a policy of engagement with Thailand. We saw that as being the right thing to do in terms of our interests in and with Thailand, and also a way of influencing thinking in Bangkok. And so Australia has a very substantive relationship with Thailand. But I think this election result, as I said, is a demonstration of um, a changing attitude within the Thai electorate, a desire to return to democracy, a, um, a, a, a move away from the conservative military parties that have, have been in charge since 2014 will be welcomed in Australia and um, may well open up new opportunities for cooperation. Thanks, Paul. Dr. Siripan, can we ask you to reflect a bit on the major outcomes from this election? Why, why was the move forward victory so, so surprising? Why was their success so surprising? And as well, how did the parties associated with the current government do? Well, um, uh, so Tom's question is, since so much why the move forward won big, as it is why the move forward uh, tsunami electoral success was so surprising. Um, I would suggest three major explanations First, it's unexpected uh, because the move forward ended Pua Thai's five consecutive win in a row. Uh, the electoral results reflected a thirst for change with the move forward seen as a better representative of change than Pua Thai. Second, given Thailand's conservative political environment, the move forward party's victory with its progressive standing is rather astonishing it also appears that the move forward has supporters throughout uh, generations, not simply among young people as it used to be. And its supporters also come from both urban and rural areas. So it is surprising that young voters were able to transfer their influence from the virtual to the actual reality of the electoral arena. And the third explanation might be that the popular narrative in Thailand is that money is a major a factor in determining whether or not a candidate will win. Uh, despite uh, spending less than other parties, the move forward constituencies uh, candidates won 112 seats, the 112 magic number. So the popularity of the move forward and social media platforms, especially TikTok, have weakened uh, provincial bosses, family, uh, politics, and uh, conventional tools of uh, word canvassing based on patronage. Um, so this, for me, changed the expectation of what, of what representatives should do and stand for uh, in, in Thailand, which will affect a voters' party linkage in the future. Uh, as for your second part, okay, let, let me answer it briefly for your, for ahead, your second please. part of the, uh, of the question. Uh, the, the, the two parties uh, found it to support the two generals, the Palang Pasharat and the United Thai Nation. Altogether, they obtained only 76 out of uh, 500 seats, comparing to 116 in the past. So I think uh, the result, uh, the electoral results, exposed Thailand's competitive authoritarian regime's vulnerability. Uh, they were unable to win the heart and minds of the Thai voters. Thank you, Ajahn. Dr. Sinpeng, can I ask you to reflect a bit on, on the results as well? And did you see structural shifts in the voting patterns? For example, it's, it's remarkable that Move Forward won nearly every seat in Bangkok. Um, and, and as well, I mean, do you think we're seeing, despite what Dr. Siripan just mentioned, do you think we're seeing some more of a youth presence or a youth force in politics going forward? I think Ajahn Siripan is right, is that the surprising element is really um how much uh move forward won uh across age groups and um and and backgrounds and i think that a big part of that was that 
the MFP actually got votes from Pue Thai. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's, there's been, a, you know, areas of Bangkok, Northern Thailand, parts of um, Isan, that, and definitely Eastern, um, parts of Eastern Thailand too, that had gone from red to, to, to orange. And in mm -hmm. fact, uh, some of the Pua Thai um, campaigning managers had given up on D District 1 in some of the provinces further north, which is their heartland. District 1 is basically capital, right? So mm -hmm. urban, uh, definitely middle class. Uh, we've got you know, people from across range that have given up. They said that we, we can't win against uh, MFP. And I think that signals a really important change. And that change is that the change might look different now, right? Uh, progress, I um, mean, this election had been viewed as uh, the end game between, you know, the progressive versus the political conservative. And the question is, what does progressive change look like? What does change look like to, to, to voters? And it seemed clearer now than it was in the last election that MFP won in the definition of change. The change is more structural. That that's what the, the change Thailand wanted. It's not just about changing from voting for the incumbent to the biggest opposition party, which is Pu Thai, because Pu Thai isn't representing structural change. In fact, if you look at the policies, which is my second point, so I think voters are voting more on policy now. But if you're looking at policies across economic line, like across different economic policy offerings of political parties, you'll see that they're practically indistinguishable. Um, so what do people decide on? They can't decide on a populist economic offerings because they all look the same. That used to be the standout quality of Pu Thai. Um, and now they're looking for, they, they, the voters really, they need more structural change. And so MFP represent what change looks like for Thailand that is more systemic. It's not just about, you know, welfare. It's about uh, we need, um, you know, a more accountable uh, monarchical institution. That's a very strong mandate from MFP. We need um, to lessen significantly the power of the military. That's through their policy about, you know, going against military conscription. Uh, we need to turn this uh, uh, political establishment upside down. And that had been... Uh, at the from the beginning, something that Fisher Forward and MP never sort of stray away from. In fact, you know, its predecessor, Fisher Forward Party, that had been advised for, for a number of years now that in order for them to expand the voter base, to get more of people in the middle ground to support them and, and not just become a more kind of fringe party, they need to tone down their attitude and tone down their, their, their mandate of change, but they didn't. They said, that's the DNA of the party. This is what make us us. We're not doing that. And you know, over time, I think more people realize that that's the kind of change Thailand needs actually, because we can't have another Prayut again. And if we vote for Prayut Thai, we may not get the kind of change we want because it's not radical enough. It's not big enough. It's not structural enough. We need a bigger change. And that's what MFP came in for. Thanks. Uh, Dr. Siripan, can you talk, talk a bit about the credibility of the election? Were there points, I think, of strength or weakness? And what was the, I know that Anfrail came out with a report recently. How, how did they find the election generally? Well, um, I think the use of state resources to benefit certain candidates and certain parties uh, and an uneven playing field for parties can be seen, uh, for example, in the drawing of constituency boundaries, which has been uh, a biggest dis dispute before the election, and uh, in the ballot design, where parties were assigned different numbers for the party list ballot and uh, ballot for each candidate. Uh, this was intended to favor a uh, certain big party and, and uh, lessen the influence of uh, the major parties. But on the election day, I would say that um, 
the atmosphere is calm and uh, adequately conducted by the election commission. So I have no complaint, a major complaint on that. But the main issue still is that the constitution gives the election commission up to 60 days to verify the official results of the election. And um, there might be a change in seat numbers, uh, whether planned or unintentional. This could undermine the move forward uh, led coalition government of eight parties if uh, some of uh, the, the MPs, the would-be MPs uh, in the uh, 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 move forward and prioritize parties uh, were dismissed. So I think the, the, creden the credential of the election commission should should have to wait and see whether how they uh, uh, verify those candidates. Just to follow up on that, is it how many seats could potentially be affected? I mean, would it be enough to tilt the balance uh, of the parties in the lower house? Yes, according to the constitution, uh, the election commission must declare at least 95% of the 500 MPs, that means 475. So um, the number would be 25 of uh, the would-be MP uh, can be exempt from the verification. And you see 25 is a lot. If uh, say 10 of 25 comes from uh, the move forward of the Puyatai, it means that there, right now 312 MPs would be less to 300 MPs. That means there's or uh, MPs from other sides of the parties to vote for them. So it will be very meaningful to select the prime minister, yes. So more uncertainty. <laughs> Um, I'd like to get back to what Dr. Sintang was talking about before, about some of the structural changes. I mean, traditionally in Thai politics, we've seen two major divides, right? The, the red, yellow, or urban, urban, rural divide, and as well, the more recent divide that you spoke about with the, um, uh, the youth-led protests um, against the conservative establishment. Mm -hmm. I, I think if you were going to try to summarize and take forward, elaborate a bit more on what you were discussing earlier, how do you think this election has shaped those two different divides? Have they merged in any way or are we seeing sort of a new kind of, of divide emerge? Yeah, that's oh, such well. a great question. Um, oh, sorry, sorry, let's go back to Sun Feng first and then oh, back to Dr. Yes. Sir Pan. Yes. Please go ahead. Oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Dr. Pan can go ahead. Well, I just, okay. I'll be quick then. Technically speaking, those divides are there. Right. But what's interesting is which narratives becomes more salient in this election. And it's no longer about the rural and the urban right. or about um, uh, the poor versus the rich or, you know, the, 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 the yagra or the, the grassroots versus the elite. These are all shaped by uh, economic inequalities. Economic inequalities is still there. Gini coefficient still high in the country. But th this election was shaped around the narratives of two key narratives. One is about generational differences and how voters vote based on the decade that they're born because those decades shape their worldview in life. So, you know, they expected basically uh, definitely Gen Z, Gen Y, um, and the millennials to be voting for Future Forward and maybe some of the Gen X, but the older population will be voting more conservative because they grew up at a time when dictatorship was was fine, you know, they 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 the high economic development. Um, but the other narrative is really about ideology, right? It's really about the uh, progressive versus the conservative. Progressive in Thailand really means we want progressive structural change, right? It's, mm -hmm. There's a spectrum of, of progressiveness. So how progressive mm -hmm. are we talking about? We're just no longer voting for the party that represent the, mili the military monarchical um, political establishment interests or we voting for a radical change and that's the progressive that M people voted M for MFP for we wanted for a more conservative uh, political establishment where being conservative actually just means you know maintaining the political dominance of the uh, the military uh, the monarchy and existing political 
political arrangements because that has served the country well. So I would say that the narratives about inequalities and um, inequality across economic divide or geographical divides mm -hmm. have never gone away, but they become less salient in this election. And the narratives that have taken over is about generational differences and the differences in the vision of mm -hmm. progressive change. Mm -hmm. Dr. Sirpan? Well, I totally agree with uh, Dr. Ames, and I think uh, Ames just put it uh, very perfectly. I think there's a new divide, uh, especially among the generations. And uh, I think the biggest divide is like anti-military or pro-military or progressive and conservative. But I mean, in Thailand, conservative is is not the same way as Western democracy uh, conservative. It's more like Thai style conservative uh, nationalist, pro-loyalist like that. And since you ask about uh, the urban and rural divide, I, I think that um, um, urban rural divide continues to, to influence voters' behavior in a way, but it can no longer be seen through the lens of um, a tale of two democracies, uh, uh, the famous uh, uh, quote by uh, Jan Ane. Uh, I did a research, and in my research, I found that the rural and urban divide is less evident in this uh, election. Um, this reflects Thailand's evolving political environment and the complicated nature of election campaigns. Uh, urbanization is emerging inside primarily rural areas. And um, I think the, the, the role played by social media platforms, uh, for example, TikTok, uh, Twitter, is blurring conventional urban rural device. And um, like Dr. M just said, the youth versus conservative device is more visible, particularly among those who favor the move forward, who would no longer uh, favor the uh, elite traditional way of thinking or, or of uh, administering the country. From my research, only about 13% of the younger generation still are uh, in this camp. Uh, overall, I believe political divides are decreasing, but going more intense. Can I add something to Jan Siripan as well? And Please, I love her, her youth work, research work um, that she did. Uh, I think that's wonderful because sometimes like I, I do a lot of work on social media and sometimes we just get the just what people put online and without talking to young people or really spending time with them you don't get a full sense of what kind of future they want Thailand to have um, and I think something that uh, we're, we're, we're kind of starting to see in this election as well is that voters wanted to vote for parties that they feel like they have a voice in, that they feel like their opinions matter. And traditionally, and I've uh, answered kind of written a lot about this, like political parties in Thailand are not very inclusive. They're not very democratic. They're very top down. Um, and they just don't operate in ways that people feel they can engage with or, or have, have any affiliation with. And move forward um, and its predecessor, Fisher Forward, kind of present this kind of new model of a political party where you want to be a candidate, you um, just, submit your application online. And some of them do video of themselves online. It's, you know, it's gonna this very open kind of um, uh, democratic, but uh, more democratic, but also this is the kind of political party that thrives on social media because it requires public input is completely open for public input. I'm, I'm not saying that the party doesn't have its top-down strategy, but just that feeling that you can be close to a political party or a kind of movement is empowering in a way that I think none of the existing political party offers. Um, unless you're a child of elites, you're connected in some way, or you're really wealthy, you can't just walk up to a Democrat party and say, hey, I want to be a candidate. No way. I tried that actually. <laughs> I was like, I have a foreign degree. I speak fluent English. Well, I guess I do. I look like the kind of elite Bangkokian you need. And they're like, whose daughter are you? 
And I'm like, well, why do my parents matter? Aren't they happy enough? Quality, you know. I'm not trying to bash talk the Democrat, but you know, nobody, no party offers that feeling that they can be part of something bigger. Mm-hmm. And Fisher Forward did that in a really big way. Move Forward did that in a really big way. In fact, if you interview their teams, I remember interviewing Fisher Forward um, campaign people, and I'm still interviewing some of the Move Forward campaign people. It's a young people, you know, who, um, are hugely underpaid or not paid, but volunteer their time to create all kinds of online content for them, memes, you know, uh, posters, organized rallies, bringing logistics. Like this, uh, it's it's because the party means more to them than the it's political party. It's a vehicle to which they can become agents of change. They feel part of this. It's more like a movement. And I think, I think the older political elites, especially completely unvalued that. And, and in fact, um, they don't think it's important. And you can tell this because for the past three years that there had been protests by young people, what did the government do? Uh, you can ask Jan Sidipan, nothing. <laughs> they did nothing. They barely covered it on TV. Actually, they didn't cover it on TV very much. It's almost like, they didn't exist. And whenever uh, move forward par- uh, politicians bring it up um, in parliament, some of the either senators as well, but uh, some of the uh, uh, MPs in the governing coalition was like, I don't understand why you let those kids do that. They shouldn't, you shouldn't allow them to do such dangerous things that get them in jail. It's like, you know, and I'm, MFP candidates are bad too. I'm not saying they're angels. They pick a fight with senators anytime they want. Like they mm-hmm. sometimes use va- foul language. You know, they just come across quite aggressive uh, at times. And I can, I'm not saying they're angels, but I just feel like the way the government has dealt with young people um, and their resistance that had expanded across age group is literally a way a lot of the voters feel. They feel belittled, devalued, unimportant, and that they don't matter. So I think the change that that represents structural change that's going to bring something completely new that isn't another party that's going to treat them like that is exactly what a lot of people had voted for. Tom, could I? Paul, oh, Joe, go ahead, Paul. Could I? Um, I very little that I've heard I would disagree with, but even though I'm retired, I'm still the ever cautious diplomat, and I just um, put in a little note of caution here, as has rightly been said. MFP campaigned very much on transformative change, Mm -hmm. substantive change. That made them very distinct from, say, Per Thai's campaign, which was about change, but it was more traditional populist socioeconomic change, which Per Thai, the Shinawatras have pursued uh, for many, many years. So to say simplistically that the two parties representing change, um, one, they represented very different sorts of change. And if you look at the vote that went to those parties that didn't represent transformative change, it was much more, it was much bigger in terms of seats than MFP won. So I think, yes, we've seen a very significant result for MFP, but there is clearly a very large number of people in the Thai electorate who need to be persuaded the transformative change that MFP represents mm. is the way to go. Mm. Um, so I think. You know, we just need to be a little cautious in in recognizing, yes, this was a very dramatic result for MFP, but there are still a number of structural issues, if you like, within Thai politics. They may not be the traditional structural issues, um, but they are still structural issues there which distinguish between um, those who accept the need for transformative change and those who may be more cautious or not as, not as enthusiastic about some of the elements of the MFP program that was put forward. Um, so in that sense, you might be able to argue that this election was important, but the next one may be even more significant in terms of if MFP is successful, how, how can it roll that success in, 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 in the next election that occurs? Thanks, Paul. Given uh, the time we have left, I'd like to move on now to the formation of the government and sort of the path ahead. Um, so 
Thailand's system is a bit confusing, especially given the role of the Senate uh, under the current circumstances. Um, I'm wondering, Dr. Zirpan, can you tell us a little bit about some of the challenges, the high bar that the Move Forward and Pua Thai coalition face in forming a government? Well, in an ordinary Westminster democracy, this election outcome will result in a move forward forming a coalition government, right? They collected 312, uh, right now 312 MPs from eight parties, uh, which uh, give them a clear and overwhelming uh, majority in 500 seat lower chamber. However, under the 2017 constitution, which was uh, designed by the 2014 coup group, to ensure its continued control over the country's leadership, both the 500 seat House of Representatives and the 250 seat Junta appointed Senate will vote for a prime minister, which means Pita must collect uh, 376 votes from, from uh, the joint session. So in this setting, uh, he faces three barriers on his way to the premiership to begin with, Pitas is currently facing an, uh, an investigation on his ownership of ITV, uh, which is the media chairs. This technicality slip up could disqualify Pita from parliament. Uh, second, move forward would have to deal with the Senate. As I mentioned earlier, at this moment, it is uncertain uh, whether or not enough senators uh, around 64 out of 250s would be willing to, to vote for Pita and respect the uh, water decision. And third, um, as I mentioned again earlier, the Electoral Commission has authority to disqualify candidates, and it is rumored that 20 would be MPs might be dismissed. So it means that a larger number of votes are required to be select Pita as prime minister. And uh, I read the question asked from, from uh, the, um, the audiences and some of them said that it's, uh, it seems that the conservative elites in Thailand won't allow Pita uh, to be selected as prime minister. I think uh, that's the biggest challenge for move forward Pita, not only for the move forward, but for uh, democratization uh, in, in Thailand. Mm. Can you talk a little bit as well about some of the recent challenges in the negotiations between uh, Pua Thai and Move Forward? I understand that uh, there have been some kind of public disagreements, particularly around the role of the House Speaker. Um, can you talk a bit about that? And as well, do you see, um, given what we were talking about before about Move Forward being a, a much more much more progressive on the spectrum, do you see? Um, Put tie, these negotiations kind of moderating move forward's position, especially in the negotiation of that MOU? Well, in Thailand, uh, there is no set political precedent about which party should retain uh, the House speakership. For example, in the last election, 2019, Kun Chuan Lee Pai uh, came from the Democrat, the second largest party. So there's no like precedent. Uh, about which party should, should keep this position. Um, the Pua Thai believes that the 10 seat differential, you know, Pua Thai 40, uh, 141 and uh, move forward 151 is not large enough or is not significant. Thus each party should control different branch, one executive that go to move forward and the other legislative branch that should go to Pua Thai. This is Pua Thai's perspective. But the move forward, on the other hand, believes that the House Speaker plays an important role in advancing the party's extensive legislative agenda. And uh, furthermore, the move forward fears that if, if Pita is disqualified, which is kind of likely, uh, the move forward may lose both positions. And I believe at the end, they will finally reach an agreement uh, on some sorts, they might trade, uh, Pua Thai might be willing to trade um, this position with some of the uh, cabinet positions that they uh, decide for. Um, we we'll find out about it uh, roughly 15 days after the election commission officially verifies them, uh, the, all the MPs, or at least 95% of the MPs, which will be around uh, the end of July. And um, 
if you ask further that what happened if Pita uh, cannot serve as a prime minister? So if he is disqualified or if the, that's two cases, right? He is disqualified or if the move forward fails to secure 376 votes uh, in the parliament, that means uh, not enough senators voted for move forward. Uh, the Pure Thai as a second largest party will have a chance to form the government. So um, it should be noted that the constitution imposes no restrictions on how long or how many times the parliament can vote. So as a result, it might stretch on for weeks or months. And this is why the position of the house speakers is crucial for uh, the move forward. I anticipate that Pure Thai will insist on forming a coalition government with the move forward first. I mean, this if the move forward fails to secure 376, the Pure Thai still uh, will insist to, to form the government with, with the move forward first. Um, because Pure Thai alliance with, party, uh, with other parties rather than the move forward might be heavily criticized, uh, mm -hmm. considering that they, they uh, vowed not to work with Palang Pasha Rat or the, uh, the Rum Thai Sang Sha. And, and uh, because uh, the electoral results uh, didn't go well for them, so they have to be very careful about this. Um, but the, and a scenario is that if Pure Thai became the government manager, still they won't receive 376 votes to achieve a majority in the parliament, then the Pure Thai led government may therefore have to resort to the former coalition parties, right? So um, I anticipate that if this happened, it will be after a period of political impasse rather than a result of intra-coalition conflicts between Pure Thai and move forward. I mean, I still have a, a, a positive idea about uh, the, the two parties forming coalition government together. I think it would be important for Australia to respond very positively, um, whatever in the circumstances. And given the nature of our interests with Thailand to respond not just positively, but constructively. Um, I would hope that, you know, people in DFAT and other departments of, uh, in, in Canberra are looking at ministerial diaries as we speak to see what opportunities there will be for ministers to make early visits to Thailand. And that's from the prime minister right down, um, given the range of interests we have. Whoever forms government in Thailand it's likely to be a whole lot of new people in new min in ministries who haven't been in jobs before, who have advisors who haven't been in jobs before, um, who may not be aware of the degree of engagement that exists between Thailand and Australia, um, who need to be um, uh, talked to, to get them to understand how important the relationship is. And also for us to look at new opportunities, um, I think a process of democratic transition that we're seeing underway. Um, in the past, Australia had very strong relations with the Electoral Commission, with the human rights institutions. Those institutions and bodies have been under a lot of pressure over the last few years. Um, I would hope that with a new government in Thailand, there'll be opportunities for us to again work with those institutions and bodies to, to re-energize them. But I say for the moment, I think it's best to let Thailand work it through and then um, within whatever context we face to respond as constructively and positively as we can. Thanks, Paul. I see Jenny has joined us again. So I think we're uh, out of time for the discussion and going to Q&A now. Yeah, we have around 15 minutes left, but we have a lot, received a lot of questions over here. Yeah, so I'll come with the first one. Uh, it's about the mass protect, uh, the protest that could happen in Thailand. So two questions here. It's about um, uh, most observer believe that the ruling elites in Thailand will not allow Khun Pitha to become prime minister. If this turns out to be the case, will the large scale demonstrations happen? And also, I would just combine another question. If Pitha potentials uh, disqualifications, 
and yeah, it's setting the move forward party to sidelining, which is also provoke a public reaction like a mass protest. So um, anyone who would like to take this question? I'm happy to have a first yeah. go. Yeah. Um, go I think ahead. we definitely can expect political contention, but in the past, and I could be wrong about this, in the past, when we see sustained large scale mobilize, political mobilization, it's when politicians get involved every time, mm -hmm. either get involved as politicians or get involved as you know leaders of movements. Um, so I think that if the protests would just be largely um, supporters of MFP, um, we may see a repeat of the past three years, which is, you know, repression, um, lack of um, regard by the incumbent, uh, and, you know, a steady decline uh, whenever they uh, put leaders in jail. Um, but online, obviously, definitely, I think, you know, protests live on online. But if uh, politicians get involved, <clears throat> we're going to see a bigger scale. Well, I, I yes, Dr. Seripan, please go ahead. I totally agree with uh, Dr. M's in saying in, in uh, focusing on the involvement of uh, politicians. Uh, to to larger the scales of the protest, but uh, to answer the question, uh, if Pitas is disqualified, uh, yes, I think uh, it might be possible that we witness street protests. But I believe that as long as the parties is not dissolved and there's no minority government led by either the Palang Pasharat or the United Thai Nation, those demonstrations will be controllable and will not spiral out of hand. Uh, like Dr. Ping uh, focuses or emphasizes if um, the, the politicians are not involved. And I think in this case, it would be uh, basically uh, uh, the contentions from the move forward supporters and, and the party itself has to eventually admit that this is based on constitution regulation uh, for the prime minister qualification. Uh, like I said, if the parties is not dissolved and the minority government is not formed, I think there's the boundary right there. Paul, please go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say I agree entirely. I think it will be a test of political leadership across the board uh, within Thailand as to how they react, um, depending on, on the circumstances. Um, but I think, too, going back to a point I made earlier that maybe it's the next election which is most crucial for MFP. So if it was a worst case scenario for MFP, I think that political that leadership may well want to consider, is it best to go forward as a constructive opposition and look to the next election when we may have a better opportunity to actually uh, take over? Mm -hmm. That's in a worst case scenario for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that is a very good point. So it draw to another questions by our audience. So if Pitha is not become the PM, who will likely get this position, like most likely? <laughs> it's a very good question, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> anyone have any case over here? Yeah, I I think I because uh, if if Pitas is uh, is not allowed to be the prime minister, and because the move forward nominate only one prime minister candidate, so it it has to be uh, a candidate from Pure Thai, right, as a, a second largest party. But I'm not quite sure whether it would be Pat Tong Tan or Kun Setha. But my my bet would be would be Kun Setha. I might be wrong. But then um, the negotiation between the move forward and Pure Thai uh, uh, ha has to be routed up uh, in other way. Like still, the move forward is the biggest party, but uh, the prime minister goes to Pure Thai. And that's, that's why I think the move forward fear about that. And so that's why they insisting that they keep the position of uh, the house speaker. Anyone have more perspective on this? Or oh, we can move on to the next question. Yes, uh, so the next question is, if, if we presume that the coalition is able to form a new government, how much pressure is on the new governments to 
we liver on radical structural chains. We have already seen the move forward party tone down its positions on the Lace Majesty Law on the in the coalitions agreements. Um, how at risk is the coalitions and how move forward party specifically to losing momentum rapidly if it failed to deliver its big promise that it had made earlier with the public. Anyone would like to jump on this one? Yeah, it's uh, got more than three hundred policies, so it will it will deliver on that, or it will it will it will do their best. And I think that's the kind. Uh, I think this is when we're starting to see, uh, I think, political cultural shift in Thailand, where voters are starting to care more about campaign promises in in a policy manner. Um, so, but they know that the two key agendas that they need to probably drive alone or tried their best to coerce their coalition partners to do it is the military conscription and 112. Um, and they have said in the past, recent past, that they would go alone if they have to, but they would definitely at minimum have that as, as an agenda to bring it up in parliament. And that, that goes back to Ajahn Siripan's um, point about why it's so important for them to keep the House Speaker position. Because if you listen to the parliamentary debates or joint sitting in over the past few years, every time an MFP MP trying to move the agenda forward, <clears throat> it's the House Speaker to decide when that would end. Mm -hmm. In some ways, they had huge fights with the government or the senator, and it, it's the House Speaker that's really limiting their time on the what they call the, the space for influence. Uh, to really drive agenda. And I think if they can get their people in that role, that would give him, them the space and time they need to pursue, especially put very likely unpopular agendas of 112 and um, military conscription. So I think, yeah, I agree with Ajahn Siri Pan. They, they, they want that, that position for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, we'll, okay, it's on sleep one. Yeah, can go ahead. I just like to add a uh, small points to Dr. M's uh, analysis. Um, it's not easy to to implement the structural reform uh, in Thailand. Uh, one reason is that because this is a coalition government, right? So it's not that all the parties join the coalition will agree on on the same agenda. Uh, for example, one one two. Most parties joining the coalition uh, disagree with uh, uh, amending it, right? Or even um, the end of military conscription. If you look at the constitution, there's an, an article in the constitution saying that it's the duty of the Thai citizen to serve as the military. So then you might have to amend the constitution or draft a new constitution first. Right, so the structural reform implementation is not easy, but to keep the promises, the move forward has to try to deliver something. So that's why they insisted on implementing the minimum wage, 450 baht right away, 100 days, but still they face a lot of um, uh, disapproval and disagreement from, from uh, business entrepreneurs, for, for example. Uh, uh, one um, policy that might be possible is um, same-sex marriage because it's on uh, the legislative process or the end of uh, monopolization of um, alcohol production that might be easier. So um, to, to, to keep the promises of structural reform is not easy. It's not easy. Can I just, um, just say on that too, um, whilst there's been a lot of attention on 112 uh, and MFP's policy on that, their, their program, their policy on, on transitioning from conscription to voluntary enlistment um, is in many ways as significant, if not more significant, in terms of the structure of the Thai political system and its implications that it has for um, the military's position in, in Thailand. And we haven't really, we haven't had time to discuss that, but um, I think it'll be fascinating to see if MFP is in government, has the speakership and prime ministership, whether they are able to push forward with that. And as you say, um, there may well be constitutional impediments towards it, but it is a, it is a very significant potential 
um, issue for, for Thai politics. Yes. Uh, so the next questions we have here is, will this be the end of Prawit and Prawit Prayut era in Thai politics? And or will they continue to hold some influence in the political sphere? Anyone would like to jump on it? Well, it would be my, mm -hmm. my wide short guess. I would mm -hmm. be, uh, this is going to be the end of General Prayut, mm -hmm. the, the uh, current caretaker prime minister. But for General Prawit, I think it's maybe another story. He still has uh, connections and influences uh, over uh, across the board of politicians. So I think he might still play as behind the scene actor, if not uh, getting an obvious position. But I, I, my, my guess is it is going to be the end of General Prayut. Yeah. Is anyone having more perspective on this one? Or I have one question. Uh, this one, Paul, you'll be a good person to answer these questions. So will there be major foreign policy change in the, with the move forward power? And will Thailand remain its positions uh, to the neighbors and allies? It also, uh, there's another question which including on how Thailand uh, policy, foreign policy toward Myanmar and ASEAN will shape. And we would bring like the peace in the whole regions. Yeah, over to you. <laughs> um, well, I don't think move forward campaign on bringing peace to the whole region. Uh, you know, foreign policy wasn't a big part of the campaign, I don't think, at least from what I could see. Um, certainly move forward um, campaigned on a more activist human rights policy, a more activist policies in climate change. Um, uh, the foreign policy dimensions in Thailand have been pretty settled for many years. Uh, there's the notion of strategic um, independence and, and balance between great powers. And I think those notions are pretty well embedded in the Thai establishment and, and practitioners. Um, I think though, since the coup in 2014, there's been a lot of disappointment across the region within ASEAN and more generally that uh, what had once been a very active and creative uh, Thai foreign and trade policy um, establishment has become um, pretty mooted. Uh, a lot of focus on domestic issues and uh, domestic sensitivities. So I would expect, irrespective of the outcome of negotiations on the coalition and who forms government, there'll be an expectation that Thai foreign policy will become more creative, more activist, both at a regional level within ASEAN more generally and also at a multilateral level. Uh, I think Myanmar will all be a very strong focus of attention. Uh, I certainly think within ASEAN there will be a hope, if not expectation, of the new government uh, will be more um, active on, on Myanmar, that because of uh, various relationships uh, over the last few years, Thailand hasn't been particularly engaged on Myanmar. Uh, and I say, I certainly hope that we'll see a more activist uh, Thai approach. And I think that's something that the ASEAN will expect. Yeah. Thank you very much, Paul. So, yeah, so Tom. Yeah, if I could just add to that. Mm -hmm. I, I think that um, if, if we were, as Paul was mentioning earlier in the program, I, I do think that if what we will, while Thailand's overall structural relations and approach to foreign policy, especially with the US-China rivalry, is very unlikely to change. Um, I think we are gonna see an, a sort of a blossoming of opportunities um, as Western countries in particular um, try to deepen relations quickly. And this is within a wider context of, obviously Myanmar is in a, a state of crisis. Vietnam seems like it's starting to lean a little bit more towards China. And there's a real sort of uh, identify, you know, a real interest in trying to have Thailand play a bigger role, especially if it moves in this direction. Thailand has been, you know, from the US perspective, a bit ignored over the last mm -hmm. several years, a flyover country, uh, as people often say in Washington. I think it would cease to become that almost immediately uh, if, if the government changes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you very much. This is a very good point. So we have around two minutes left. Uh, Tom, would you like to wrap up from this whole section? We still have received a lot of questions, but I think uh, we can 
we I will ask all the speaker and reach out to you individuals. Yeah. So Tom, the floor is yours. Sure. Thank you, everyone, for joining. And uh, this has been a fantastic conversation. Obviously, a lot of uncertainty still ahead. Um, I think all of us really would like to see Thailand land on its feet, move into a new era of, of, uh, of, of stable government um, that reflects you know, the wider electoral uh, wishes of, of the population. Um, you know, the next couple of weeks and months could be, um, a, you know, further uncertainty. Um, but, you know, I think all of us are hopeful that the negotiations will go well and that, you know, from where I sit, I think Thailand has enormous potential, especially in foreign policy in the region, um, should it, you know, be able to get through this transition successfully. So uh, look forward to that. And again, hope that, uh, you know, hope that things go well over the next couple of months. Does anybody else want to jump in with final thoughts? Can I do a quick uh, promo? <laughs> um, <laughs> I just wanted to say that one of the great things about Australia is that it's home to um, one of the largest Thai expats communities in the world. And as a result, I think, you know, it's not just what the Asia Link has organized here, but there are multiple opportunities to engage uh, both in person and online, you know, about what's going on in Thailand. Um, so if your questions didn't get answered today and you live in Australia or, or even elsewhere, um, you know, um, you definitely can get in touch with me. Um, even though I'm based in Sydney, uh, Sydney University, I'm, I'm aware of what's going on in terms of discussion about Thai election elsewhere as well. Uh, and I think that's, uh, that's one of the, the, the great things about, you know, about Australia actually being Thailand not just being important to Australia, but there's a lot of ties here as well. And so to keep this conversation going, you know, in Australia, uh, in Thailand and elsewhere, I think it's really great. So thanks so much for this opportunity. Yeah, thank you so much, Naeem, and also uh, every speaker here today. And thank you for the audience for this uh, listening throughout one hour we have together. All of your answers, all your, all of your questions will be answered, and I hope everyone's having a good evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.